Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I see folks are continuing to log on. Excited to have you here for um, this session, the Rural Rental Housing Preservation Academy. And um, want, we have a robust agenda, so I'm going to go on and get started with, uh, with the sort of preliminary discussion so that we can get into our great slate of speakers today. Um, I want to be sure to acknowledge um, as I said, I'm Robin Wolf, Senior Program Director for Rural and Native Housing here at Enterprise. And I wanna acknowledge Adrian Norwood, who is also on our team and is supporting the call and has been a tremendous help um, throughout the Academy, supporting all of our um, AV needs and these backend needs as we meet in this virtual space. So very thankful for Adrian and for her participation. As is our practice, and part of this academy, we will begin the session with a land acknowledgement. Today, we are joined by Juanita Salinas Aguila. Juanita is the program director in the Enterprise Seattle office, where she oversees the early, early learning facilities fund through the Home and Hope Initiative in Seattle and has graciously joined us today to provide our land acknowledgement. So with that, Juanita, I will pass the mic over to you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Juanita Salinas, Program Director with the Pacific Northwest Seattle Office. Um, I'm very grateful to be here joining you from the state of Washington here to do the land acknowledgement for this region. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm presenting to you from the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the first inhabitants of the Pacific Northwest. This territory is that of the Coast Salish people. The Coast Salish people's territory spanned originally from the British Columbia, Canada region through Washington and Oregon. And that includes many, many tribes, cultures, and languages. Today, I'm specifically joining you from the land of the Duwamish tribe, who to this day is still fighting for federal recognition. I ask the all in attendance, take a moment to honor with gratitude the land itself and commemorate the Duwamish people, both past and, past and present. Despite generations of ongoing colonization, violence and broken promises to Duwamish peoples and the Coast Salish peoples continue to persevere and their ongoing commitment to this land and their heritage contributes not just to our local Seattle area, but to the entire state of Washington, British Columbia and Oregon. <clears throat> uh, my hope that with this acknowledgement, we begin to chart a path towards greater awareness of native sovereignty specifically for the Duwamish people who continue their fight for recognition. In coming together, please take a time to embrace your connection with one another and our connections to the land and the spaces we occupy. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, um, for that and um, for sharing that land acknowledgement with us and for the reminder that we can take time to um, connect with the land that we all occupy as we come from different spaces today. With that, I would like to um, just provide a little bit of information about Enterprise. Enterprise is a national nonprofit organization that addresses America's affordable housing crisis. And our vision is to live in a country where home and community are stepping stones to more. Our mission is to make home and community places of pride, power and belonging, and platforms for resilience and op upward mobility for all. This is, as I said, our last regional session of the Pacific Northwest Rural Preservation Academy. We have talked about the the landscape itself here in the region, um, looking at stock and talking with USDA office about the RD 515 program, the properties that exist within the program and the transfer process itself. We have presented case studies about preservation projects that have worked successfully and that are still in process and addressed them um, and looked at different federal and state housing finance programs that help support preservation. We'll talk a little bit about more about that today as, as we explore um, policies that can support additional dollars that come into these projects. We also talked about basic deal structuring, pro formas, funding the gaps, thinking about um, 
538, but other alternative sources like green and energy efficiency improvements that might be covered by other programs, looking at the capital needs assessments that are required for this type of work, and also really doing some deeper dives into the 515 transfer process. Most recently, we've come off of talking about property management and disaster preparedness and mitigation and uh, the community and resident engagement session we had last session, um, which was really rich. And um, I, if you didn't get a chance to take part in that, um, the recordings will all be will all be put together and Adrian will send that as part of a blog release that we'll have where you can access all of these past sessions if you're interested in, in revisiting any of these or having or sharing those with your colleagues to revisit any of these sessions. Today, we will focus on local and state policy. And on October 6th, we will host a national conversation with Dan Rogers from the Multifamily Housing Preservation and Production Office, um, and also hope to have a slate of um, national experts, including um, representatives from local legislators and national legislators who are going to talk about the importance of making some national changes to our preservation efforts or the preservation dollars that are set aside through policy for, for these projects. We must um, also thank our partners, Fannie Mae, JP Morgan Chase and Co., the Oregon Housing and Community Services, OHCS, and the Collins Foundation. And of course, thank USDA, our D multifamily office, the Washington Department of Commerce, the, the Washington State Housing fin Finance Commission, all who've helped us with this work. And um, with that, we have done all of the, the housekeeping and we'll just get, we'll dive right into the conversation on local policy. So I will do a little bit of, um, frame setting just up front. And then we have a slate of speakers, um, two from Oregon, Rob Prash, who you all have met before from NOAA, Brian Hoop, who is the ED of Housing Oregon, and Michelle from WLIHA. Uh, I'll give them all better introductions as we get closer to their sessions, but looking forward to a great conversation about what's going on at the state level. And um, with that, I wanna talk a little bit about what's, well, um, what can happen at the local level. And by local, I'm thinking municipal, county level, and state level, right? But a lot of these can happen even more localized at the municipal and the county level. So town, um, town, city, county. Um, there's quite a few tools in our toolboxes at that level, looking at things like um, notice and right of first refusal laws, particularly relevant as we think about preservation, um, extended affordability periods for projects that might already have affordability restrictions but are coming on to expiration, code enforcement, information collection, meaning let's just make sure we know actually what is available for us um, in order to preserve and what is needed, what needs to be preserved um, in terms of stock, policy coordination, looking at um, making sure that the policies on the local level jive with the policies on the state level, and then how those correspond with um, different federal programs like HUD and RD, financial incentives for affordable housing production. So as we look at not only preservation, but thinking about production, are there incentives that can be offered at the local level? And that includes things like buy right, and then buy right development is also on the production side. Zoning um, can also be considered on a production side, although important for us to think about as we advocate for affordable housing broadly in our communities locally. So I'll start with the notice and right of first refusal laws. This comes up quite a bit in preservation conversations because, because it's what could, could really be a lever for us to be able to keep properties um, in service. On the, market, on the market rate side and on the affordable side, it requires owners to give residents advance notice of any intention to sell. Um, when combined, it can allow residents to match a legitimate offer for the property. So you're seeing, you see that a lot um, in terms of cooperatives um, on the, in mobile home communities, but this can also happen within a building as well in terms of cooperatives. The right of first refusal laws can vary in length of time. Um, 30 to 90 days. 
even that outside number 90 days is still a short amount of time to try to figure out how to, for solutions and how, what money could be needed to acquire. So that's something to consider as you're, if you're hoping that your community can adopt a right of first refusal. And then um, some cases, the tenants can purchase the property themselves. But there's two factors that have to be put into place really quickly. And I think are really important as this, as these kinds of laws uh, or these, these sort of um, ideas get passed is that the tenants are going to have to be able to find somebody that has experience in purchasing and operating the rental housing, and there's going to be money needed. So if, if you're propping up a right of first refusal law, what is on the other side to actually ensure that there's a, a tool to purchase on it, you know, within those 30 to 90 days. This is all also noting that the change in ownership can lead to higher rents um, or the new owner will decide not to renew leases for the existing tenants. So this is why we want to give um, tenants the option of right of first refusal if it's available as a tool. Want to note that some of this happens on the state level. I um, just kind of talked about mobile home communities that there's a a state legislation in Oregon. There's other there's other conversations and other state initiatives that that might supersede. So if you're considering this or considering promoting this within your local community, you need to really be sure you understand what's happening at the state level in this respect as well. We the other piece that could happen is if there are dollars like CDBG home or local affordable housing set asides, um, there are some ways to think about extending the affordability period. Um, and I just highlighted that um, Denver, the city of Denver moved its affordability period, I put to 60, 60 years. So it had previously been 25, I believe. So just thinking about there's ways to do that. That said, again, we have to think about um, using that in combination with an incentive or a way in order to like rehab the, the properties to make sure that there's dollars to actually keep those units in a, in a good space and in service in a healthy and safe way. So something else to be considered as we look at the extension of affordability periods, but again, definitely a tool that could be, could be used, particularly if you're in a jurisdiction that has access to CDBG or home and awards CDBG or home dollars. Um, must recognize that the long-term ownership is really important. So kind of highlighted that earlier, but put it as an extra bullet. So I wanted to make sure y'all knew about it. Um, code enforcement comes up a lot, I think, as we think about preservation, right? So it's a sort of, it's a really complicated issue as we think about well-executed code enforcement that, you know, is designed to help maintain the quality and the safety of units, but also can, code enforcement can be used to shut units down and to take units out of service. How do we think about using code enforcement together with some other policies to ensure that there is long-term preservation? And given that um, this tool can work best as you think about rehab tools. So is there something on the single family side, like the 504 home repair program, um, something like a LEAP or energy program? And um, are the units if they are, in fact, unable to be salvaged, what are the options? Is there a way to think about a land bank or to take the land um, into ownership, like on the municipal level? And can that be banked for future use of affordable housing? Reduced and waived fees comes up a ton as we think about production of homes. Um, local jurisdictions can encourage new development by reducing and waiving the fees. These can be anything from like in lieu of park fees and um, document fees, all sorts of different fees that could be waived at the at the state level. Um, there is a program uh, in Austin that they list, I think, oh, 14, oh, 18 different fees um, that they waive in Austin. So the, that is something to be considered. Like they include public works, watershed protection, well, um, traffic impact analysis, zoning fee, interim to permanent zoning fee, miscellaneous zoning fee. Yes, those are all different fees and different um, in that jurisdiction. So thinking about how all of those fees can really add up as we're trying to get dollars together for affordable housing. And if a community really wants to promote affordable housing, 
considering waiving those fees for the purpose of projects that support affordable housing as defined by that jurisdiction, right? So um, that jurisdiction could decide affordable includes up to 80% AMI or up to 120% AMI. Um, but I would imagine that they would have some sort of restrictions or want a long-term commitment for that property on the other end if they are going to waive a um, considerable amount of fees. And then um, some communities, exactly, they want the affordability criteria to be really specified at the front end. There are also incentives for producing housing that can be thought of um, and also really be thought of in terms of preservation. The local housing trust funds, we know, we think about those in large metro areas, but they're not just for large metro areas. We've seen them happen um, with mill levies, similar to how you might see a mill levy happen around a school district, um, creating a, a different kind of set aside for affordable housing that serves as gap um, in a kind of regional, for regional housing authorities. Um, in resort communities, this has happened in communities in the Mountain West around uh, resort communities, they have, um, local housing trust funds in, for example, Summit County in Colorado and other communities where there's very high cost living, trying to think about workforce housing. And then the only thing to think about with that is that can we make sure that those dollars that are put aside, if they are set aside, are available for preservation. So thinking about how do we use those funds for things like pre-development? How do we think about gap financing with those funds? How do we think about um, accumulated, accumulated capital needs, meaning these CNAs that we have that come up that are really, uh, could, could add up really fast in terms of needs, in terms of dollars, can making sure that the dollars that we create or we set aside can be used for all of these purposes. I think we'll get into a little bit about some of these as um, Rob speaks a bit, as, as you're looking at this in Oregon with the money that's been set aside, making sure that um, it really suits the needs of what the, the affordable housing community is looking for. Another huge piece as you're thinking about a local or, or smaller jurisdictional level is coordination. So how do you think about what, what's in the HUD mandated consolidated plan and making sure that preservation is part of that? That has to happen on a smaller jurisdictional level. So even as, as somebody who provides affordable housing in the county, making sure you're having a voice as those things are considered, hopefully that's already happening. But if it's not, like reaching out to to your county, to um, your city about, about that process as that process goes on and making sure that someone who understands the work you do is sitting at the table as, as those consolidated plans are created and approved. Looking at um, thoughts about a council of governments, this can really help when you're in smaller communities, creating um, a council of governments or COG to create consistency from jurisdiction to jurisdiction especially as we work in smaller towns, especially as we work in counties where there's a lot of unincorporated area, having a council of governments where all five of, for example, the, the towns within a county are working together to be consistent with their incentives and with their programs that um, creates less competition and just really ensures overall that we could have better um, better understanding. It also makes it easier for those who are developing to know that even if they move five miles to the west, or if they decide to acquire something that's five miles to the west of their current property, they can still have similar compliance for both for both properties. Um, this also can think about establishing a preservation committee or consortium. We'll talk a little bit about this later too. How can we think of at the state level, at the local level, creating a group of advocates ahead of time or proactively that really are interested in preservation of affordable housing and making sure that everybody's at the table, including the housing authorities the nonprofit organizations and the government agencies that really make a difference um, and can make a difference in terms of policy to support this effort. And I want to just highlight as we get back to the right of first refusal, because it's a big tool that we think about in terms of preservation, is that we, you really need to think about what's available. And this also should include, I'm not sure if 
in this list is not included, but things like CDFIs um, and other funders, you might be able to come in for that quick acquisition. Um, that's really important that it happens before the opportunity comes up because um, we can't turn around often like large amounts of capital in 30, 60 days. So having these kinds of ideas, the resources ready um, for, for acquisition can be really, really important. And then um, we talk about zoning a lot and it doesn't affect preservation in the same way generally as it, as it might affect new production. But I think it does affect preservation as you're thinking of physical structure um, and maybe a structure that was first set to be a church or first set to be some other kind of community building that now could be rezoned for the purpose of also including housing. So we're thinking about a large multi-family redevelopment sites. Can, how does zoning factor in as we consider that? Other pieces of zoning or specific parts of zoning that make a huge difference as we're looking at costs or parking requirements. There's um, always the conversation of density bonuses. I know that doesn't often resonate with our rural communities, but it is something just to highlight. Um, one that has gotten a lot of attention um, in the past couple of years is the, the concept of accessory dwelling units. It's a way to increase density, but without really changing character of um, a certain neighborhood or community. And um, could, I mean, in allowing accessory dwelling units, you could theoretically, you know, double the amount of units you have in your community, or at least double the allowance of units you have for your community overnight. Um, so something really to be considered and to be looked at. Often the ADUs, some folks call them granny flats, some folks call them alley flats. Those um, are smaller, they might be more studio style, and so often they are more affordable. Um, as well. Considering by right um, in lieu of case by case, this can just make it much easier on the developer side if we say instead of going through all 18 of those specific fees for fee waivers, if you are pursuing an affordable housing project or development, if you are working on the preservation or acquisition of what was once affordable and you want to keep it affordable, what waves, what can be waived kind of on mass. Um, so these, these 10 fees will be waived. That helps a lot. It allows it to go through in a much quicker way. And then uh, we also often talk about on the municipal level, inclusionary zoning. Inclusionary zoning can be pretty tricky to, to consider, but um, really also another tool as we think about particularly in pr production. Um, so if we're going to put in a new property, how much of that zone, how much of that property should be required to be affordable? Should there be a requirement for it to be affordable? Something to consider. I think it can be considered in preservation as well. If you're preserving a project, particularly if you're thinking about when it's affordable right now to the community, you're trying to preserve it into long-term affordability maybe there's a mixed income strategy that you, you approach here that would, could include um, an affordable requirement and then allow some to, to grow with the market. So there's a couple of thoughts on how that can work and a couple of models for inclusionary zoning. Most of them on the city level are, are thought about in terms of new, pro new production. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to a conversation um, for, from Rob Prash. Rob has been leading um, a series of conversations in the state of Oregon about a large set, large amount of money that has been set aside for affordable housing preservation. And Rob has been uh, leading that conversation, helping um, the practitioners in Oregon think about how that might be prioritized. So. Rob, oh, and Rob is from NOAA, and uh, I forgot to introduce you, Rob. You have been a, so such an integral part of these conversations that I feel like most of us know you. Um, and NOAA is uh, actively working on the, as a CDFI to preserve and produce affordable housing in the state of Oregon. So, Rob, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. All right, great.
And thank you, Robin, for having me back. It's nice to be here. Um, again, it's Rob Crash with Network for Orient Affordable Housing. Um, next slide, Adrian. And just real quickly about NOAA, um, I'm gonna fly through this because I, we've already talked about it, but NOAA is a certified CDFI. We were formed in 1990. Um, we currently have about $300 million in loan capital that we administer off, uh, across several different programs, including um, our permanent loan pro, uh, pool. Um, we offer short-term acquisition financing, targeting um, uh, land and um, preservation projects specifically. We have uh, pre-development loans, tax exempt bonds, and we're a, a recently approved RD538 program lender. Uh, we're also very active uh, as housing advocates in uh, policy development. And so we're in Salem quite a bit and we work closely with um, the housing agencies, both the state and federal level. Um, next slide. I just want to talk about my role as a director of preservation for NOAA. Um, I manage the Oregon Housing Preservation Project, which is a, um, a collaborative um, public-private partnership that was established in 2007 to focus on preserving affordable housing in the state. Primarily, at the beginning, it was primarily focused on um, rent-restricted, I'm sorry, um, rent-subsidized properties that were coming to the end of their contracts. Um, and as I said, it was a pretty broad um, public-private partnership with our state and local housing agencies, um, HUD and rural development around the table. And there was a broad range of stakeholders that were both um, nonprofit and private sector partners. Um, and I have to, of course, mention the support we've had from Oregon foundations and some foundations around the country. Um, particularly uh, want to mention Meyer Memorial Trust and Collins Foundation, which has been a great supporter for us. Um, and then just mention that the, the Preservation Project Steering Committee really set out uh, a, a number of goals early on, which we blew past or after a few years and we just kept going. So we're always looking at new strategies, um, evolving um, uh, needs and so forth and try to stay active on that end, um, pursue legislative changes and funding as we can. So um, next slide. So this is the headline um, that came out uh, early in the summer. Oregon legislature approves $100 million to fund preservation. And, and so this is what uh, Robin asked me to talk a little bit about today. And she teed up a few questions that um, I could address um, for you all today. So let's just start with the first one. How did advocates of affordable housing preservation secure $100 million? That is a ton of money. Um, next slide. So you see from this slide, it wasn't something that happened overnight. Um, advocates, uh, and particularly um, the Housing Alliance and and uh, the preservation um, project have been down in Salem every year since 2007, um, testifying, meeting with key legislators, developing legislative champions, um, trying to get bills uh, uh, passed and also develop um, support for dedicated preservation funding. And we started out the bang in 2007, eight and 10, but it sort of tailed off after that. And the main source of funds over those years has been lottery backed bonds. Um, and so it's dependent on projected lottery sales. Um, there's, it's sort of like a, a big grab bag that everybody wants to access those funds. And so um, it's very competitive every year, but we did well, um, you know, some years better than others. In 2017, we really kind of broke through and got a, a large award, uh, $25 million that went out quickly um, through Oregon Housing's various NOFAs. Um, in 2019, again, we got 25 million, but unfortunately COVID hit, lottery sales plummeted and that bond sale was canceled. And uh, so the 25 million didn't materialize, but in, in some ways I think that contributed to 
our success in getting this hundred million dollars in 2021. Um, uh, and just for perspective, that hundred million is more than all the other years combined. So it was a big breakthrough. There's plenty of demand though. Um, next slide, Adrian. So as Robin suggested, um, uh, there's lots of discussion around uh, the next steps and priorities for deploying these funds. And um, one of the things that, that we did, the preservation project was we've been facilitating a series of policy discussions. Um, and there's been about, uh, typically it's been about 40 people on each of those calls. Um, they've been pretty fast, um, limited to an hour, tried to stay on a specific uh, topic so that we didn't get um, too far off. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more um, in a minute about what various um, recommendations came out of those. But so we conducted these meetings, formulated recommendations, and then those were transmitted in formal memos to Oregon Housing and Community Services. At the same time, um, Oregon Housing conducted a partner survey through the month of August, um, trying to get input into priorities for their funding um, and priorities for revisions in the QAP. And that, that closed in early, uh, of just uh, I think about a week ago, they closed that survey. Um, there was a whole section in the survey on uh, what they should do with preservation. So. Um, all this is very useful information. The, um, the QAP revision is kicking off this week with a, a meeting tomorrow. Um, the department will be conducting stakeholder meetings all through the month of September. And I think there's two sessions planned to further discuss um, preservation policies in the QAP. Also, um, Oregon Housing in the past, and we'll do the, the same this biennium, it's published a, a funding calendar for the two years that outlines all of the uh, offerings that they will have and what they're targeting. And so they're, they've got a draft of the funding calendar coming out shortly. And also they will publish um, frameworks for each of those offerings. Uh, and so that's a great opportunity to provide feedback on what they're targeting, what the criteria are scoring and so forth. It's a really great tool and I applaud them for doing that. Um, one note about the $100 million, it's general fund money. So it has to be obligated by the end of the biennium in June of 2023. Next slide. Robin asked, what types of projects rise to the top um, in terms of priority? And, and again, these are in the discussions that we've been having with uh, a pretty broad range of stakeholders. Um, aging HUD and RD properties with project-based rental assistance have always really floated to the top of that list. And I think they continue to do that because they bring all those federal dollars and they allow extremely low income households to, to have um, quality housing. So that's going to continue, I think. Public housing undergoing a full recapitalization through RAD or Section 18, those have um, had pretty broad support as well, as well as uh, manufactured housing communities converting to co-op or nonprofits. What we have seen in the last few years are uh, an aging rent-restricted portfolio, um, like home properties, light tech properties that are um, coming to the end of their restrictions that need recapitalization. And it's there's really not a lot of great pathways forward for them. So that was a priority expressed pretty broadly. Um, and then of course, small and rural preservation projects are always challenging um, because they can't easily use bonds and 4% credits unless they're doing a portfolio transaction. So. That's a priority. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then how has the state defined preservation? This is something that has evolved over the years um, as the portfolio and the risks have evolved. So um, we started out again with um, those projects with uh, project-based rental assistance, qualifying for uh, the department set-asides and other preservation-focused um, offerings. Um, manufactured housing community preservation 
those projects converting to co-ops or nonprofit ownership, those um, got wrapped in fairly early on and have uh, had access to funds now since about 2010, I think. Um, in 2012, just responding to the new RAD program, um, public housing that was undergoing a recapitalization and conversion um, was added to that definition. And then in the most current um, award from our uh, uh, appropriation from the legislature, the definition was expanded to include all rent restricted properties. So the publicly supported housing portfolio that needs some attention as it's aging out. Those are all eligible now. So this this inventory is has grown um, considerably in the last ten years, I would say. Um, and just important to note that in some cases, the definition these definitions are actually in statute. So um, next slide, please. <laughs> now, out of those conversations that we facilitated. Um, there were a lot of great suggestions and a few um, new approaches to preservation that were recommended. Um, the first was combining preservation and redevelopment in a single transaction and allowing the developer to access those preservation funds for that transaction. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, you know, oftentimes we'll see older HUD or RD properties um, that are really at the end of their useful life. And you try to preserve them just to maintain the subsidy contracts. Well, if it's possible to maybe re redevelop that site, um, does that make good sense from a policy perspective? And I think overall people felt that it did. The other um, advantage could be that you could get considerably more units on a site um, because of upzoning of that site. So, so I think there's pretty broad support for that. Another really interesting proposal was to create a pool of grant funds that you could pair with the Oregon Affordable Housing Tax Credit um, to allow some projects that just really need to do minor rehab uh, and recapitalize or refinance um, without having to get tax credits or compete for other really um, competitive resources. So that would pair like maybe $5,000 a unit um, that would go with the affordable housing tax credit loan uh, and, and make those deals work. Another uh, suggestion was to set up uh, and offer a, a set aside for culturally specific organizations to access these funds and kind of level the playing field. Um, another was to expand our 25%, um, 9% preservation set aside in the tax credit um, NOFA each year to include the rent restricted projects. That would be a, that would probably require expanding that percentage from 25% um, up to maybe 50%. And then the last was um, to pursue legislative change that would allow the Oregon Affordable Housing Tax Credit passed through exemption on all rent restricted properties. And that's a kind of a technical thing. So I'm not gonna spend any more time on that, but um, I think um, I'm gonna stop there, Robin. This was um, just sort of an overview of, of what we discussed and how we um, um, made some recommendations to the state. And there's a minute or two for people if they wanna ask any questions or you can move on. No, sure. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for providing that context. And um, I want to see, I want to open it up, make sure if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Or there's like a little hand at the bottom. If you raise your hand, I can allow you to ask the question instead of me interpreting said question for you. Um, but uh, I mean, I think I, I mean, I, my, my question is I've been participating in these meetings and, and listening in on them or mostly listening in to make sure that I'm understanding what are the needs of, you know, those in Oregon who are working um, to prioritize these dollars is there's these, these definitional questions are really big, right? And still unknown, right? As, as we think about what is culturally specific, what is a culturally specific organization is that, um, 
led by, is it BIPOC led in terms of director, in terms of board of directors? Is it BIPOC, prim, primarily BIPOC serving, right? You know, um, are there, you know, as we think about, and again, I think that, re, uh, that redevelopment meets preservation question is really interesting. And I'm wondering, do you feel like there's enough uh, synergy, you know, within the group to, to make sure that there's, you know, good momentum around kind of getting, getting that congealed or some sort of, you know, kind of common, common thought as, as you move forward, looking at those conversations? Sure. Yeah, well, I would start with the, um, the culturally specific organization set aside um, uh, in the BIPOC definition, I mean, whatever definition that they would land on. There's been, um, the department's been moving in this direction for some time. I don't know that they're at a place where they're um, ready or willing to establish a set aside, but I think the industry is kind of at a place where they would be um, accepting of that. So we'll just see, um, of course, these are all decisions that the department has to make. Um, they do actually have an extensive definition that they have used for culturally um, specific organizations and culturally um, uh, uh, responsive organizations that, that they've included in their tax credit NOFA and home NOFA and um, the Department of Justice actually <laughs> wrote part of it. So it's a little technical, but it, it hits all the, um, the main points, I think. Um, to your point about redevelopment, um, I think there was pretty broad support for that. Uh, the main concern is that a redeveloped property continues to serve roughly the same um, population it was serving before and that it doesn't become a tool for gentrification or displacement of specifically or especially of communities of color. And Portland has a long history of displacing communities of color um, repeatedly uh, out of neighborhoods and, in, and pushing them to the suburbs and out to the edges. So uh, we really wanna be careful that that doesn't happen. But I would say hundred million dollars um, being so much more than we've had to do work with in the past definitely opens some possibilities to um, try new things and experiment a little bit. And then I have a question from Marty that's coming through and um, he's asking from a timing perspective, do you have experience successfully aligning the state investments with RD's review and approval process and, and the and the timelines that come forth, you know, through an RD transfer, for example? Boy, Marty, I wish I could say that, that yes, everything works great. You know, it's it's um, it's actually really disappointing how slow those processes go, and they put some of these awards at risk, and it's criminal because, you know, in the end, the state here and in many states are bringing all the resources to preserve these properties, and you know, and the department tends to you can't get out of their own way to make it happen. And it's really, it's really um, needs to change because they're gonna lose properties. And we know that there's a wave, a huge wave of mortgage maturities coming and we need to get out in front of those and do as many as we can before that wave hits because it'll just overwhelm the system. So um, I'm hopeful that Dan can kind of grease the skids and get things moving over at RD uh, it seems like every time I get somebody in there that can uh, make a difference, um, they move on to another GSE or some other for, uh, you know, a private enterprise. Um, and so we're losing that capacity within the department. Yeah, no, and I think that's a, a plug for October 6th session. Dan, um, as uh, Rob mentioned, is Dan Rogers, who's the new director of Multifamily Housing Production and Preservation Division. Um, so uh, I encourage you to register for that session. Adrian, I'll put a link for you to register for that session, take part, and then also bring up some questions as we come to that session. Um, submit some questions for us to ask of, of Dan and RD as we think about that, because it is, it is a concern 
timing is a concern. And, and we're seeing, as, as Marty echoed, they're seeing similar issues in Washington with the, the state funds not always aligning in timing yeah. with the RD funds. We'll, we'll just we'll just phrase it as that. Um, so thank you so much, Rob. Really appreciate your participation and your willingness to be here throughout so much of the academy and to share kind of what's going on um, in Oregon from the perspective of NOAA. Um, we're going to bring in uh, Brian Hoop, who's the director of Housing Oregon. Um, and Housing Oregon is a statewide association of nonprofit, well, of just housing advocates, actually, and groups that are working to promote affordable housing in the state of Oregon um, and works to ensure that all Oregonians have a healthy and stable place to live. So, Brian, I'm going to um, turn it over to you just to kind of provide an overview of what are the priorities coming up um, in terms of in terms of affordable housing at the state legislature, what have you seen recently in terms of new bills happening, any um, other kinds of highlights that you'd like to kind of mention um, on the state level as they as they as we think about preservation specifically, but also just as we think about affordable housing in rural communities in the state. Thank you, Robin. Uh, just to clarify, uh, Housing Oregon is a statewide association of uh, mostly nonprofit organizations uh, working on the spectrum from homeless services to developing multifamily rental housing to uh, home ownership development for low-income, um, low-income Oregonians across the state. So uh, yeah, just to cover kind of an overview of various issues that uh, we've been working on. So about a year and a half ago, we started a rural policy council. So every other month, roughly about 20 to 30 of our members, mostly executive directors and housing developers or or a staff who are leads on policy issues and the organizations have been coming together. Uh, a few of the issues that that group has been uh, addressing with, uh, you know, had a lot of uh, staff from Oregon Housing Community Services participate to try and encourage a dialogue between uh, uh, our members and state agency. Uh, definitely this past year, uh, Wildfire um, response and recovery issues have been a major element. Uh, roughly, I think seven or eight counties across the state uh, had major, uh, were, were uh, significantly impacted by uh, the catastrophic wildfires here in Oregon last year, uh, fall of 2020. And uh, just as Rob celebrated uh, the funding from the legislature for preservation dollars. Uh, I think it was roughly about $150 million was allocated for wild, wildfire recovery efforts. Um, I and the other members um, were participating on the state's uh, disaster housing uh, recovery task force. I'm forgetting the exact name, but uh, we helped uh, with uh, advocating for and helping uh, give input on as a state develop their uh, strategic plan uh, to help guide response um, efforts over the next several years. So that's something I think we'll wanna continue to uh, participate in tracking and working closely with the uh, OHCS. Um, there was also a legislation that was passed um, providing additional funding for, or is it, uh, manufactured home replacement efforts. So that's, will be, I think, largely, uh, I think it was $2.5 million. Um, I'm sorry, Rob, if you already mentioned it, replacing manufactured homes for people with low and moderate incomes. Uh, let's see, prim primarily making uh, changes to uh, their, pro their pro state's program, allowing wildfire survivors to access the funds. And that provides a uh, specifically $2.5 million for manufactured home replacement efforts. Um, so moving beyond wildfire recovery, uh, you know, we'll also be continuing to monitor and work with the Housing Alliance and state officials around response to the COVID, um, not necessarily preservation issues, but I mean, a key issue we've been involved with over the last year and a half, as far as, uh, you know, advocating for the rental uh, or the moratoriums on the rental evictions, uh, but also rental assistance dollars. I think the uh, thing that we're very fortunate about here in Oregon is Senate Bill 282, Senate Bill 278, 
uh, during this past legislative session have uh, extended the time period for individual households to pay back past due rents uh, to next February. So while the eviction moratoriums are, you know, have expired, um, uh, you know, people will still have more time to uh, um, pay back their funds. So that's something I know we and many other organizations are continuing to advocate to try and help work with uh, low-income renters to try and help make sure we do everything possible to make sure that they're not evicted um, this year. Um, some other key issues are our group has been working on that have been important to them. Uh, as uh, Rob mentioned, the right of first refusal, refusal issue is something our, our uh, policy council took a position on. And so we'll be continuing to advocate with uh, state and federal folks helping support us. Uh, Senator Ron Wyden, who's uh, introduced the DASH Act um, that would uh, help address that issue on a national level. Um, and uh, some, some of the other issues that our members have been really concerned about uh, capacity. I mean, these, these are just some broad issues that there's no easy answers to, but that my members are interested in addressing. Uh, capacity issues um, with you know, the, the significant increase in new resources. I think roughly about 900 million, almost $900 million was uh, funded by the legislature for the range of homeless services, housing production, home ownership opportunities. Um, I think there's concern with many of the smaller uh, rural-based community organizations, whether you know, finding the capacity to hire additional staff, especially in a tight labor market right now, to be you know, ready to help do all the pre-development work that's gonna be required over the next several years. That's a concern that I'm hearing from our members. Um, rising cost of property insurance and gaps in uh, filling gaps in construction financing over this last year with a lot of the wild fluctuation cost uh, due to the COVID or impacts to the economy with COVID. That's something a number of our member groups have been addressing. Uh, the legislature did uh, or provide a $5 million uh, funding opportunity to OHCS to help cover um, uh, gaps in construction costs. And I think we're waiting for OHCS to finalize uh, what, how they will be distributing those funds. Um, and then we also did have a conversation um, uh, with OHCS this spring, uh, I, and maybe Rob mentioned this briefly, but related to the uh, push and OH, OAHI inventory at the state tracks for expiring properties. I thought it was really interesting for our policy council here that five of seven counties most affected by expiring contracts uh, in the state's uh, portfolio in the next 10 years are rural and rural, uh, rural Oregon, Oregon counties. So I think that's something, you know, we we'll want to be trying to, uh, you know, work with Rob and with the state on and trying to help raise awareness about that, especially related with uh, the uh, Rofer issue. Um, Let's see, a few of the pieces of legislation that passed this year that I think will be really interesting that we should be tracking. Um, Senate Bill, let's see, where are, Senate Bill 8 is, addresses the issues of uh, removing barriers to affordable housing development by allowing affordable housing to be built in land currently zoned for commercial land, publicly owned land, religiously owned land. So I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities to, you know, building, uh, partnerships with faith-based groups um, and even uh, you know commercial or property owners of commercial properties to expand the range of uh, uh, housing, you know, affordable housing that can be built uh, in smaller communities across the state. Um, so that's one example of a, a land use a legislation that that passed recently. Um, let's see a few other. Oh, the, what I, another issue I think that we should be we wanting to be tracking is in 2019, House Bill 2003 passed, which uh, required um, cities over 10,000 to study future housing needs of residents and develop strategies that encourage production of housing needs. And also the uh, state's Department of uh, Conservation Land Development uh, wrapped up. It also would require them to do a regional housing needs assessment that they wrapped up this last winter. And I think that's something that both of those issues will be now that we're through the legislative session um, this next year, engaging our members and 
trying to help monitor that and connecting uh, our, our members with their local jurisdictions and how they're uh, how they're going to be implementing those uh, requirements to have uh, develop their own local needs and production strategies. Um, and a few other issues that we're working on uh, address, or addressing racial um, or equity and racial justice. The uh, legislature had also um, uh, uh, made permanent the creation of the uh, racial or task force on racial disparities and uh, housing and also creating one a task force on racial disparities and homelessness or home ownership and then a separate one on homelessness. So I think those are opportunities to be more engaged with the legislature in the coming years to, you know, kind of zero in on you know, how are we addressing uh, racial justice issues and uh, homelessness, you know, not just in urban areas, but across the state. Um, we, Housing Oregon was fortunate to receive funding uh, from Meyer Memorial Trust uh, that will start this fall. We're partnering with Hacienda CDC to develop a uh, uh, to build a coalition and to outreach and engage with uh, uh, culturally specific BIPOC-led organizations. And again, we had that conversation earlier about how you define those uh, BIPOC-led organizations. But what this is, what this effort will be addressing, this project will be addressing, is as Rob had mentioned, you know, OHCS has been over the years increasing expectations around partnerships with culturally specific groups, increasing uh, you know, expectations around utilizing minority women, small emerging business uh, contractors. And I've definitely heard from many of our rural member organizations the challenges they're facing with trying to uh, uh, find contractors in rural Oregon to meet those expectations. And also with uh, you know, developing partnerships with culturally specific groups. So it's our interest to, you know, through this project to try and kind of help bridge that gap, bring uh, you know BIPOC-led organizations and our member organizations together, but also to develop. Um, we're hoping you know develop a series of recommendations over the coming years um, to advocate for things as Rob had mentioned, um, set asides for BIPOC groups, um, or you know ensuring that the expectation around partnering with culturally specific groups. Is that truly helping build the capacity or investing in kind of the building the wealth or the, the capacity of, of those organizations instead of just being maybe a short term contract for resident services? But, you know, how does that help maybe provide opportunities for, uh, uh, you know, ownership stakes in the project or, or uh, you know, uh, having a role with lease up, for example? So I see Robin. I don't know. Do you want me to call it quits there? No, no, I think that's, uh, I, I just want to make sure that we have time for questions. Um, I know uh, there's a folks from Hacienda on the call or anybody if they want to um, kind of add in on some of those conversations. I do think it's really, I, I think that it, I think it's really important as we think about racial equity and we think about historically marginalized populations, how we really work to promote that. But also knowing that like, as you're talking about rural like requirements for contractors in rural communities where we already have like a, a tight squeeze on trying to find enough, you know, enough different bids that it puts it puts pressure sometimes on the projects as we think about it too. So curious if anyone on that call has any thoughts on that or lots of folks here from Oregon um, on the call. So if you have some questions or want to just kind of um, raise up anything, um, welcome you to do that either through the chat or Q&A or raising your hand. Um, really though, I have to commend like the groups in Oregon, um, you know, and it just all of the organizations who work so hard in Oregon, right, from the nonprofits on, on, the, on the ground level to, to, the, to the larger statewide groups like NOAA and Housing Oregon, because there's a tremendous amount of work and support being done at the statewide level. And I know that that's because you've really lifted your voices up and, and, and over a long period of time to make sure that, uh, that those priorities are being seen. Um, really one of the leaders in the country in terms of how many resources are set aside for preservation and really thinking about preservation. So um, just a, a pat on the back to all of you for that work. Um, and so, uh, like I said, I'm going to open up the line real quick to see if there's any questions. Um, if not, Rob, it'd be great if you could 
um, stay on the call. Michelle is going to talk about what's going on in Washington so that we can have some like kind of a panel conversation with them um, between you know, housing organizations in Washington and Oregon about how we can cross pollinate ideas and learn from one another um, and what might be good shared best practices. So um, seeing nothing come through on, um, on the chat side or on the Q&A side, I'm going to uh, wrap up, Brian. Um, did, did, did you get to everything you wanted to get to? Just first make sure that's true. <laughs> It's fine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's many more I could talk about. But. Okay. Oh, I got somebody with a raised hand too. Yes, of course. We always have other things I think that we could talk about. So um, uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's Kevin, see. Kevin Desi. Kellogg from Hacienda is on the call. And yeah. And Desi's raising her hand from, oh yeah, you see Hacienda is going to work. I'm excited, Kevin, about you working with uh, Housing Oregon. Well, so to, to bring up what Kevin is asking about is, yeah, we, we definitely, um, We'll be, we're open to feedback on organizations we should reach out to outside of the urban areas. So um, that's, okay. that's something if anyone has feedback, you can contact me directly or, or put thoughts in the chat box. Yeah, Kevin, it looks like I've opened up your line. So if you wanna say something or Desi, also your line is open. So you can take two turns there. <laughs> Uh, I, I can jump in really quick. Um, we, we've been working in rural Oregon for the last year. Um, we were almost a totally rural, or, um, excuse me, a totally urban neighborhood based organization for the last 30 years. And uh, we've taken a very slow, deep approach to developing relationships uh, throughout uh, Oregon at all levels. And we really feel like we've just sort of scratched the surface, but we've gotten a good idea of what some of the obstacles are, where some of the partnerships can be, where there are gaps in the supply chain. Uh, and uh, differences in culture and politics uh, and, uh, and so forth between the Portland metro area and, and rural areas. And one of the main things we see as a real opportunity is to create partnerships with local uh, nonprofits, for-profits, organizations that advocate for housing, want to become uh, housing operators, owners, asset managers, uh, where we can, we and some of our other partners can partner with uh, rural organiz organizations uh, to um, have more success with funds at OHCS, with tax credits. Uh, I'll leave the RD to Desi to talk about, but uh, this is one of the things we're really just starting on. We'll be having a strategy session, a workshop uh, internally uh, in the next month to talk about how we can expand this. And so I just wanted to get that on Brian on your radar and Robin, uh, anyone else on the call. So that's, that's kind of where we are on it right now. That's going to unfold over the next, uh, if anything can happen between now and funding in the uh, 2022, great. Or otherwise we'll just keep rolling throughout the uh, next year and identify future funding opportunities. No, that's great. Thank you, Kevin, for that. Um, and yeah, Robin, if, yeah. if I could just mention, yeah, I, I think it's also, it's a long-term effort that, you know, building the relationships, Kevin's correct, that, um, you know, there's a lot, I mean, I think it it's an opportunity we have with all these significant new resources that it would be a shame if we're not taking this opportunity to, you know, start building those relationships and expand the, the range of organizations and even contractors who are part of the affordable housing ecosystem uh, you know, what I'm hearing from some of our members is, you know, we've got a lot of catching up to do with, say, Washington and California, where there's a much broader range of organizations. Um, and just so I think that's one of our biggest challenges is I think what I heard Kevin saying is, you know, maybe helping uh, uh, you know, encourage and working with some, uh, you know, emerging, you know, uh, culturally specific organizations in rural Oregon who maybe never worked in housing before, but you know, maybe helping show them a path forward where there might be opportunities to you know, become more active in the industry in the coming years. Yeah, I agree. A lot of this is long-term. Desi, did you have something you wanted to add? I uh, I think that what Kevin said is just spot on. I think that um, you might've stolen my thunder a little bit because I was going to mm -hmm. ask the same questions that I love hearing uh, what is happening uh, to carry on the conversation and so that was that was uh, 
essentially what um, I was going to ask uh, Brian and, and others is that what can we do? What are just, you know, three things we can do um, short term to move this forward? And, and also, of course, thinking long term um, is also important. Um, we had an, a great conversation yesterday at NHA about houselessness and racial equity, and inclusion, diversity issues, BIPOC um, kind of concerns, because it's just um, those two really align, unfortunately. But um, I think that it's, I'm just seeing that um, I'd love to have more conversations around that, um, whether that's, uh, you know, Oregon based or West Coast or whatever, because, uh, you know, um, it's important to keep keep moving. Um, and uh, so I think I, my question was answered, but Brian, if you wanted to add anything else of what uh, um, what we can do in the short term to support your work? Well, one of one of the components of this project that we'll be in collaborating with Hacienda is to identify, and do case studies lifting up success stories. So we're going to be looking for examples of housing developers who have successfully partnered with culturally specific organizations, you know, and really developing longer term partnerships, uh, you know, looking, you know, that have actually, you know, are helping contribute to wealth creation and building staffing capacity on the long term with, with, with other uh, culturally specific organizations. Uh, and then we'll be building this advisory committee of, of organizations that want to try and start developing recommendations, um, you know, like contributing to, if not this year's QAP, since it's going to be over quickly, but, you know, if you, the two years, the next QAP update effort or the 2023 legislative session, what might be recommendations that, you know, we want to develop over the next year and a half, uh, you know, getting ready for future policy discussions with the legislature, with the state. Great, and if, if folks on the call might be interested or listening to this later, what might be interested in the advisory committee, Brian, how would they learn more about, should they reach out to you directly or, or in the rural policy council work in, in general, is, what's the best way to kind of get in touch with that work? I'll put my email in the chat box and the rural policy council meets uh, every other month, uh, third Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Uh, okay, so, so this is the public November, announcement. <laughs> Fantastic. I find this um, conversations to be really great. And I'm so happy that there is a rural focused conversation that's happening at the statewide level. So um, if you're not taking part in that, and you are part of um, and you're working in rural communities in Oregon, um, it's a great place to sort of hear what others are, are working on. And I think tap into some of this um, momentum that um, has really been built up in the state of Oregon. So thank you so much, Brian, for agreeing to um, come in and talk to us about what's going on. Again, I'm really impressed by what's happening at the state level um, in your state. And um, with that, I'm going to turn the conversation over to Washington State. We haven't heard much about what's happening in Washington State right now, but some great things happening in Washington as well, um, dollars set aside. For, for rural preservation specifically. And um, I'm gonna have Michelle Thomas, who is the, I'm gonna get your title right, correct here, hold on. Um, the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance and has really been leading a lot of, of the effort at the state capitals to around um, a pool of money that can be used specifically for rural preservation. So Michelle's gonna talk to us a bit about how, um, how that priority came up, how that how that came to be, and then what is next? Um, what's next for us as advocates, and as we think about promoting that um, at the state, you know, at the state level? So, Michelle, I'm going to turn the mic on over to you. Hi. Well, thanks so much again. I'm Michelle Thomas. My pronouns are she/her with the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance. We are a statewide organization that works primarily on state policy, some on local policy, some on federal, but mostly at the state level to secure the investments needed to build more affordable housing and to preserve affordable housing and to prevent and end homelessness. 
Uh, we have a statewide membership and several uh, folks on today um, from ORF are really important members of the Housing Alliance. So I'm excited to see Charlie and Marty uh, participating today. I also just wanna acknowledge that they are really significant um, experts in this issue area and have helped the Housing Alliance uh, to understand and prioritize the need for preservation and affordable housing development in general in uh, rural areas of Washington state. So very special shout out to them for their incredible work and partnership. Um, you know, similar to Oregon, Washington, of course, has a severe affordable housing shortage. And so any loss of any affordable home in our state state's affordable housing portfolio is devastating. So we're really concerned about the many properties in our state with expiring use restrictions. So we worked with our members um, to advocate for a dedicated pot of state dollars designed with the input of nonprofit affordable housing experts to ensure that the application process and the requirements around this pot of dollars um, would work. So um, we specifically focused on the process being a rapid application um, and appropriation process, different from the way our uh, dollars currently work in the State Housing Trust Fund. We wanted it to be more quickly um, available. So uh, we were successful in securing the funds and it uh, was designed to be a first come, first serve application process and the application remains open until all the funds are used. So this allows, or it's designed to allow for the community to respond to emerging opportunities throughout the state to purchase properties as they come up for sale. So um, we secured $10 million in the state's 2020 capital budget. And then we secured an additional $10 million in the two-year budget that was passed this past legislative session in April, 2021. Uh, these appropriations together so far have um, saved 464 aff affordable uh, apartments, all in rural and uh, small towns in Washington state. The state, uh, Washington State Department of Commerce oversees the funds and they have been a really good partner in this. They worked really closely with us um, in the initial uh, drafting of the budget language for the initial $10, uh, $10 million dollars. Um, to ensure that the bu budget language would work for them um, as they appropriate the funds. The communication and collaboration was really important to ensuring that all the stakeholders shared the same understanding um, and expectations about how the application and appropriation process would work. There was some um, resistance initially on the department side uh, when we first started talking about our intention to advocate for the initial $10 million. The initial resistance was uh, based primarily on concerns about creating a new program that was outside the normal housing trust fund application process and outside of those procedures. These concerns, as I understood them, were rooted mostly in workforce issues, but working closely with, that, with the department to ensure that they would administer the funds in an efficient manner helped to alleviate those concerns. And since we as stakeholders and our members also wanted efficiency and a streamlined process, this worked out really well. So lawmakers were initially totally unaware of the problem of expiring use restrictions. It helped that the properties we were discussing, um, primarily USDA funded properties, did not have state dollars in them because it didn't raise concerns or questions about the integrity or usefulness of our state housing trust fund program, which is all state dollars, enhanced by federal home funds as well, but it's a state appropriation through our state's capital budget. We also had, um, we also have in Washington state an existing pot of money set aside of our trust fund dollars, specifically for the preservation of the housing trust fund portfolio. And that's existed for several budget cycles. That's primarily uh, focused on repairs and upgrades to keep the portfolio healthy and in good shape as the earlier funded properties um, are aging. The Housing Trust Fund was first created in the early 1980s. So the first round of investments um, in properties are, are really raising some preservation issues as those properties age. 
But the, the point is, is that state lawmakers were receptive and already had some understanding of the need to preserve our investments and to pervert, preserve our state's infrastructure. So um, we started the 2020 state legislative session with an affordable housing briefing for lawmakers. We had speakers from key issue areas and from key parts of the state, including several who focused specifically on the unique needs in rural Washington and in small towns. We had a special focus on the risk of losing federally funded properties in rural areas. And the head of the House Capital Budget Committee was in attendance for that briefing. He represents a rural area of Washington state and was very interested after hearing the significant numbers of units we risk losing. The presentations com uh, combined four key elements um, that ended up being very persuasive. So we had uh, data on the number of units um, at risk at the time. Uh, we focused on education on what the federal programs are, what USDA is, uh, why they fund affordable housing or what the program looks like at least. And uh, key terms and facts like expiring use restrictions, even though um, the lawmakers present care deeply about affordable housing and, and what's going on in rural communities, they don't speak affordable housing language necessarily. So we really use the opportunity to um, provide that really important background. We also uh, discussed why owners might want to sell the properties. Um, we also had a discussion on the impact of the loss of the units and what that would mean to the communities and what prospects the tenants would face if they lost their housing. We shared demographic information and discussed the risk of displacement and the fact that many of the folks uh, have extremely limited options to obtain new affordable housing, especially housing that is accessible and safe um, and affordable. And we also provided an example of success that had already happened in Washington state to show what could be accomplished with state dollars. Um, there was an opportunity council project up in Whatcom County, which is the uh, Northwest uh, area of the state that had um, fairly recently at the time of this presentation um, secured a USDA property and preserved it. And so we had a, a, a couple of panelists actually who spoke to that, including a Bellingham city council member, um, Bellingham's a, a city in uh, Whatcom County. Um, additionally, so throughout the process, um, once we piqued the interest of lawmakers with that panel, uh, throughout that legislative session, we worked on the budget language, strong relation and, and the advocacy um, and lobbying to secure these funds. Uh, strong relationships with key legislative staff was really critical throughout the process, both to make sure that the budget language was written in the most useful way, and to also ensure that they had the information that they needed to brief and educate lawmakers so that they could quickly provide answers to questions that came up. Also during the legislative session, Senate staff, um, who I had relationships with, contacted me after receiving a really troubling constituent contact from an elderly, elderly woman who is being displaced from her home. Um, so this happens, you know, uh, oftentimes um, part of my job is to support legislative assistance when they get calls from constituents. Lawmakers, a big part of their job is um, casework, honestly, getting calls from constituents who are facing problems and trying to help them problem solve and connect them with resources. So they had received a really troubling call from an elderly woman who was being displaced from her home. Um, after I looked into it, it turned out that what was happening is that her apartment had been a USDA funded property in uh, Paul, Paulsville, Washington, and it had been sold already to a for-profit private rental market developer and her rent had been increased and she was no, ling no longer able to afford it. Um, as I said, she was elderly, but she was also disabled and now was facing eviction into a housing market that had literally no affordable options for her. So it was really troubling. Um, we connected her with resources. I don't know what the outcome was. I'm concerned she probably um, experienced homelessness, honestly, um, because there wasn't an opportunity to save this property. Like I said, it, it had already been sold. But it exactly illustrated the problem that more tenants would continue to face if we um, didn't intervene. 
um, the tenant actually happened to be a constituent of the key budget writer in the Senate. So we were able to help uh, use this terrible story to make the connection um, and bring it close to home for that key decision maker. Um, in terms of displacement, um, this is a really uh, critical issue, of course, and we've already been talking about it today, but it was also a really critical part of our advocacy and education for lawmakers to help them understand who lives in rural housing in, in Washington state, particularly USDA funded housing. Um, and the Northwest Justice Project, uh, which is an organization in Washington state worked with us to provide data that showed that the program is often more, uh, provides housing, funds housing, that is oftentimes more diverse by race than other housing in rural communities. Um, and actually, the Northwest Justice Project recently, um, or a couple months ago at least, wrote an article that was published in the Journal of Affordable Housing that dives into this a little bit more. And I will put the link to that in the chat in case um, folks haven't seen that. It's actually um, a really interesting article that talks a lot about their work in Washington State to save USDA housing and has some really um, important critiques of USDA that I think um, probably all of you have already personally experienced, um, but um, would also perhaps find um, helpful to see in print. Um, so um, uh, in order to secure these funds, strong advocates statewide were in advocacy statewide was absolutely critical. Um, and we're able to bring more conservative lawmakers in our state on board with this appropriation. Um, they were able to see a direct tie to their districts um, with the ask, um, you know, rural districts in Washington state. Um, so nonprofit housing experts like ORF and Spokane Housing Ventures, and of course, uh, the Northwest Justice Project were absolutely key in educating lawmakers to secure these funds. Um, and good news was also that USDA was actually really helpful. I didn't personally work with them directly, but I was told repeatedly by the Washington State Department of Commerce that USDA was working closely with them to ensure that the one that the budget language when it was first being written was workable. And then that when the first round of funds were secured, that uh, USDA um, worked with the department to um, ensure that those dollars could be rapidly used to um, save housing. So that's good news. I know that historically USDA has not always been easy to work with. So I hope that this level of collaboration and communication continues and that improvements continue to happen. Um, so the quick and successful use of the first $10 million was really critical in being able to secure the additional $10 million in this last budget round. We were able to prove that not only was there a need for the funds, but that there was a pipeline of nonprofit developers who were ready and able to utilize the funds. Um, I'm convinced that if we had not been able to quickly use the first round of funds uh, before the next budget conversations began at the beginning of this year, that we would have been um, faced a lot more obstacles in securing additional dollars and perhaps even have been uh, unsuccessful in securing additional funds. And it looks like this additional $10 million um, will also be able to be used up pretty quickly. Uh, the first round of money was used and enhanced uh, by the department with an additional $2.5 million from federal home funds to save 150 units between seven properties in Washington state. These were all in rural or small towns, including Deer Park, Leavenworth, Okanagan, Brewster, South Bend, and two properties in Sunnyside, Washington. The new pot of money um, added to this year's budget already has three applications totaling 6.5 million uh, for properties in White Salmon, which is in Klickitat County, Washington, and in Yakima and in Sunnyside. Um, interestingly, one of these properties um, is quite large. It has 256 homes overall, and it applied for a waiver of the $2.5 million cap that otherwise was written into the budget language. Um, we wrote into the budget language though that waivers would be allowed um, at the discretion of the department. Um, but because that property is so huge, um, the overall cost of, of purchasing the property obviously is higher. So they've applied, applied for a waiver. Um, so um, in order 
just looking forward, in order to continue um, securing investments for preservation and potentially even increasing it from you know, allotments of $10 million, we definitely need to keep educating lawmakers on the problems. The Housing Alliance is monitoring the notices of intent to sell that the Department of Commerce receives. Lawmakers in Washington by state law are required to send um, notices 12 months ahead of time to the department. But we need a much more efficient way to track the at-risk buildings in Washington state. The National Preservation Database has been um, a useful tool, but it seems like it doesn't always perfectly square up with what uh, we know on the ground in Washington. So we definitely need to continue, continue to utilize that tool, um, but we need to improve them in Washington state. And we definitely need to continue to educate lawmakers from both parties on the risks that our communities face. We also need more conversations to assess the needs around rehab dollars. The fund that we have created in Washington state can be used for just acquisition or it can be used for both acquisition and rehab. And these funds can be coupled with the state housing trust fund dollars as well. But I think a more thorough assessment of the overall need, need of the overall need and the risks over the next several years would be extremely helpful as we move forward with state legislative advocacy. Um, in closing, I really appreciate the overview um, by at the beginning um, on the by Robin on the exploration of where other improvements can be made. Uh, be made. Washington's law that requires a one-year notice was one back way way back in 1989. So this conversation has been happening in the state for quite a while, and it's been improved and updated since. But exploring things like a right of first refusal, I think, is a really important next step. Additionally, like I said earlier, the um, article that I put in the chat by the Northwest Justice Project also speaks to improvements at the federal level um, that would be really helpful in uh, saving more properties as we move forward. So with that, I also just really wanna invite um, folks from ORF, um, if you're still on, to add any additional thoughts, both on the need in Washington State, next steps, and any of your thoughts on the campaign to secure these funds. Um, because uh, like I said earlier, ORF is really the expert in Washington state and they were absolutely key in securing uh, these, these dollars. Thank you so much, Michelle. And um, Marty, if, or Charlie, if you raise your hand, then we can open up your mics um, uh, to allow you to speak on some of that. I um, think Michelle, your point about the inventory and having um, a need for a really clear database is really, um, salient and important. Um, Brian uh, mentioned it a little bit, and I can bring Brian in um, on this conversation too, but they did create a uh, specific statewide inventory in Oregon, and I think it has been really helpful for them as they prioritize um, and could be a model as you look at how to how to get that capitalized and housed um, and funded, um, because the preservation database so I call it that more generically, the idea of a sort of statewide preservation database that includes not only RD and not only HUD, but also that what's in the housing trust fund portfolio, CDBG and home, anything that's been financed as part of like the Department of Commerce, for example,'s portfolio could be really um, important to help you communicate and other and help us to connect nonprofits with the most at risk, because I think that's the other part that's really concerning especially as we look at our D portfolio is that there's not, um, there's a lot of for-profit ownership currently. And so how do, how do we transition that and get that in the hands of um, good long-term actors? So Marty, I, your, your line is open so you can talk. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And Michelle, thank you. That was a really excellent overview. Um, the, the state investment has been a tremendous resource and, and is making a big difference. And we really appreciate all the work that you did to help guide, guide us through that process. Um, I just wanted to mention two things real quick. One is, I think one of the challenges that, that we face with um, identifying uh, when a property may be lost as affordable housing is where we don't know when the current owner may elect to try to prepay it. You know, so so on paper, it might look like the mortgage doesn't mature for another 10 or 20 years, but they could elect to enter into this other prepayment process at any time. 
uh, which uh, in which case um, it, it could then convert to market rate, which Michelle, I think is a lot, probably what happened in that unfortunate scenario you, you shared with us in Paul's bow. Um, and the other, the other thing is, um, you know, a big advocacy challenge, I think for all of us is, is just um, as we talked about with Rob during the organ presentation is, is trying to get RD's attention to say, look, we're, we're bringing a lot of valuable state resources um, and, and your process is really problematic at, at rural development to help, you know, just kind of streamline the process uh, to, to make the transfers occur. And, and they, that, that federal agency, I think, continues to struggle with how to do that more effectively and efficiently. Uh, so so we're, we're going to continue to work on it, um, of course, but I just wanted to add those two things. And again, um, thank Michelle for that, that great overview. Yeah, I do. I see what you're saying, Marty, is something that might expire longer than, you know, two years from now could still be at risk because, um, because of the prepayment opportunity that is allowed through, um, through the RD process. Um, Brian, I want to invite you to, um, if you have any thoughts on kind of how that preservation database has worked in Oregon um, and how it, or if you have any thoughts about how that might hit that might help um, the overall preservation efforts. That'd be interesting to hear from you. Sorry, Robin, <laughs> I'm not sure. I've got enough knowledge yet about it. I, Delor I just put a link in to the webpage for that program. Uh, Dolores Vance is the uh, program manager at Oregon Housing Community Services for that program. So she joined us at our May meeting and, and spoke briefly about it, but I have to admit, it's not an issue that I've uh, gained a lot of knowledge about yet. Sorry. No, 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 thank you. No, thank you. And I think part of it is because you have it already in place. So you're not actively working to advocate for putting, for putting it in place, which is, which is good news. Um, so uh, I, I do think that um, those of you like uh, Marty at Orf and Michelle, if it could be interesting to connect with OHCS and to see how that's housed. Um, I know, um, Michelle, you mentioned, and I, and I think this is an interesting, not an interesting point, but something I think we often hear as advocates of resistance around just kind of like capacity within the agency to administer set-aside dollars or, or the thought of set-aside. What helped you to kind of break through that barrier, that concern to move this forward? I think... Um... The focus on efficiency and making sure that everybody had a shared understanding. I think one of the things that's hardest for uh, the department and departments in general when they're um, working with stakeholders and appropriating funds is when they're the biggest time, the most time consuming and biggest conflict arise when there isn't a shared understanding of the process and the goals. So the communication with the department was really key and allowing them to be have a say in how the budget language was written to make sure that it worked for them and being flexible um, and addressing their, I think, somewhat you know, legitimate at the time con concerns around staffing. Um, they were facing other pressures and other appropriation, um, potential appropriations that would also have impacted their staffing. And it's in our interest um, that they're fully staffed, that they have the capacity that they need to appropriate all these funds in an efficient manner. And so we really found common ground in wanting to make sure that they didn't um, you know, feel like uh, they were gonna be in charge of a program that they didn't have capacity to run. And we had common ground, like I said earlier, in assuring that the funds were um, able to get out the door in the most efficient and quickest way possible because that made it more streamlined on their end, but it also makes it more streamlined for developers across the state who want to respond to um, emerging opportunities. And like Marty said, sometimes these opportunities come um, without a lot of um, expectation because 
the prepayment process, right? They can sh switch from, you know, just being in that mode to suddenly having an intent to sell. Um, so it, it allows for um, a quick engagement. Um, so that was really, so I think just finding common ground, um, not resisting them as a stakeholder, recognizing that they're a stakeholder. Well, honestly, though, we also didn't give in to everything they wanted. It was a negotiation. Um, and we had already convinced lawmakers that this was really important. And so I think the agency worked really well with us, but saw this is going to happen. So we need to make the best of it. Um, and um, that really brought them to the table as in just in a collaborative manner rather than a fully resistant manner. No, that's really helpful. I also know that sometimes it's as um, um, we've advocated for for changes in terms of like funding dollars to, to make sure there's administrative dollars as well as part of that um, set aside so that that way that can help address that issue as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that can um, be helpful. Dolores um, from OHCS um, put in the Q&A that the PUSH program or publicly supported housing preservation process requires um, through Oregon, they're requiring that the owner notify OHCS and the local government 24 months prior to RD prepayment. Mm -hmm. so that's interesting too. Um, Marty is, you know, thinking about that concern about the prepayment. They're given a, a bit of a heads up um, Oregon's put that on through through that program. And so far, it's working um, as recently the owner was just referred, she was just saying somebody had just been referred to her um, by RD regarding their prepayment request. So um, that might be something also to consider um, as you're as you're looking into that, Marty and you know, Michelle, as you help support a lot of this, this legislative request that ORF puts together. I am um, do want to say uh, Oregon has a Rural Housing Policy Council, and basically it's a working group of folks in the state of Oregon that are interested on in rural preservation issues and just rural issues in general. And so it might be something we can think about if those of you who are in Washington working in rural community. Um, working in rural communities interested in expanding your work to more rural communities thinking about even using that as an offshoot of the TA cohort to continue to do some, to have maybe quarterly conversations about rural priorities. I think that's something we wanna, we could lift up here um, and take forward um, through and at the state level um, to, to in, enterprise could help coalesce that group at the beginning so that we could get that settled. So, um, so that said, if you're interested in that, um, let let me know and we will make sure we get a group of folks connected on those issues and maybe establish some real local local time. Now, lots of um, info being shared from Brian too on the push on the um, push preservation database. Um, Michelle and Marty for you to dive into or anyone else in Washington who's interested in that work. I also um, Michelle and excited kind of about reading this journal of affordable housing that you just shared with us. It looks like there's two different RD preservation articles in the same uh, journal, which is really interesting. Um, so looking to dive into that, that is um, also in the chat. So with that, um, I think that we're going to, seeing that there's no additional questions being asked, um, we're going to kind of conclude the panel. Michelle, we can you can turn off your camera, which I know um, is always nice. And I excuse, please excuse the fluffy dog tail in the back of my office. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to really um, extend my gratitude on behalf of Enterprise for the time that all of you have put into this for the, we've had, oh my gosh, I think more than almost 40 guest speakers as part of these sessions um, here on the regional level. And um, really want to, to thank all of those who've contributed in terms of content, um, or who's contributed in terms of content and is working strongly on TA, Larry as well. Um, and then all of you have taken time to participate and put in, um, we're getting on, uh, I don't know, so, uh, 
50, 60 hours at least of work um, individually to um, take part in all this, the academy sessions and then in the other cohort sessions. So I really just want to um, extend um, my appreciation to all of you who've taken part in these sessions. And um, Adrian just shared that there's a survey in the session. Adrian is also going to share um, the registration for October 6th. This is our last session together on the regional basis, but as I said, please um, don't hesitate to email me and reach out to me directly or to Adrian directly as we want to extend this work, as you want to continue to advocate and support um, rural preservation work in your community and in your state. Um, we will do our best to make sure that we're all connected and we're all working in the same direction because it's really, this is important work that we're all doing. And more importantly, it's important work that you and the field are doing. And we want to make sure at Enterprise that we're able to support that in a very meaningful way. So with that, we are going to wrap early, give you back um, a couple more minutes in your day. Please take at least a two or three of them um, as a time for, for reflection. Um, and maybe, maybe that reflection can help you to fill out this survey as well. And we will hopefully see you at our October 6th session. It's here um, in, the, in the chat. Um, click that and go on and register for that conversation so that we can, as we talk to RD and we talk to national um, policy advocates about what we can do for U.S. to promote um, preservation and think really clearly about USDA stock that's at risk. So with that, I um, say goodbye. It's our last sign off and uh, wish you all success in your, pro in your programs and hope that we continue to be in partnership as we move this work forward. Thank you.